Last week I had some difficulties, eyesight and other things, so did, today I'm trying it a little different. Remember the paper I laid on this week, last week? No, that's going to be this week. <laughs> uh, the um, one from the book of Acts, I want to keep going because it's an exciting thing, but not today. But it is a very exciting book to read of how the church grew. That's, that's what the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, the things that they did, places they went. How did they grow the church? Who was involved? So that'll be another day, another time. So uh, the whole idea was spiritual um, success. How do you get your, your own personal life successful with the Lord and with the people around you? And how you help this or that church or uh, things that the church, church does, activities that the church does? How do we get involved? How do we become successful at calling people to Christ, bringing them to Christ? teaching them about Christ. Um, if we're not uh, rowing personally, how can we help those around us to grow? So we need to be involved in, in spiritual success in every part of our life, spiritual and church and so on. All, all of our lives need, need to be involved. So the first thing that came to my mind for success was uh, in Joshua when he was taking over for Moses. And he felt the responsibility. He felt the depth of responsibility. It was on his shoulders. And he didn't say, ah, let me at it, you know. I've helped Moses since we were back in Egypt. You know, Joshua didn't look at it that way. So we could shorten the verse a little bit, but no, I think we want to read verse 6, 7, 8, 9. In Joshua, first chapter. <laughs> Joshua, the first chapter, for the story of Joshua, getting him started. So I'm going to see if I can... The lighting is just awkward here. I don't think I can see that. I may have to turn this bulb off. Uh, what do I do? This won't be needed here anymore for the time being. That'll help me get this guy over a bit. And don't worry if I have to enlarge my screen <laughs> so, uh, so that I can read it better. And uh, things are getting better with the surgeries on my eyes, but I still need it a little bigger so that I don't have to get so close. So here we go in Joshua chapter 1. And I want to begin at verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people that thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give, give them. That's verse 6. So he said, uh, be strong, be of good courage. We need encouragement every once in a while. We need it given to us. We need to give it to others. But he said, you know, explaining who these people are. Well, these are the ones that I'm bringing into the land and Joshua is going to lead them in. Whoops. Was he prepared? Yeah, he had 40 years with Moses. Okay, so at least 40 years of helping Moses. Uh, how do we know that? Because they were supposed to go in once and didn't. Mis disobeyed God. So they had to spend 40 more years in the wilderness. So Moses was at least 40 years with Moses learning side by side. Then we get verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Whoa. First things off the book? I thought this guy studied the law for 40 years. And that's the first thing that God is talking to him about, about the law? Yeah. We need to be reminded. We need to listen need to do according to God's will. But God wants us to be strong and courageous in our belief, in our belief system, and the way we handle things, the way we do things for God, to be strong, be courageous. So he mentions the law. 
which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Okay, well, you've got to go back in the Bible, find out where Moses is, and read what Moses had to say. Some people say, oh, I'll just cut this book in half. You can take this half out and throw away because you don't need the Old Testament. Bad idea. You need every word back there. Remember in the New Testament it says every word is needed, is blessed by God, is directed by God, um, spoken by God, spoken by holy men of God of the Old Testament. We need every word back there because they didn't have this Bible. When Paul was preaching, Peter was preaching, he didn't have this. It was being made. He was inventing. No, God was speaking to him. He was writing it down or his best man that does the writing was writing for him. Somebody was writing it down. And we know that when you look in here and you find Luke, he was writing for somebody else. He was paid for the job, right? And he traveled everywhere Paul went. How do you know that? Because he said, we went so and so. Oh, he was with them. Yeah. Luke went through the water and through the floods and through the people and through the countries and you know, Luke was with them. Sometimes it says they did so and so. He wasn't with them then. He's reporting. He's a reporter like the newscasters. He was a, he was a reporter of what was going on. So those things are a blessing to us to know and the Old Testament scriptures are a, still a blessing for us. And the law of Moses is often referred to that way. Um, God gave the laws to Moses. Moses wrote them down and gave them to the people. Ah, so. <laughs> yeah, you can't blame Moses. <laughs> he was the receiver of the laws. All, all God's laws, 600 and some, besides the Ten Commandments. A law for anything, if you borrowed the neighbor's lawnmower or his, his animal to eat the grass, <laughs> um, there's a law about that. How do you handle it? Did he pay you for the animal? Did he pay you for the use of the machine? Did you hire it? Did you rent it? That, that's all there. You just have to read a little and in, interpret a little bit of what those things would be in, in our world, how we'd handle it. So here the... Uh, I can back up here a little bit. Moses, my servant, God's servant, uh, commanded thee. So it sounded like Moses made the commands. No, it was Heavenly Father that made the commands. And he gave them to Moses. Moses commanded the people what God had already written down. Turn not away from this law. Okay, how does this read? Turn not from it to the right hand, turn to the right, or to the left that thou mayest prosper in whatsoever thou doest. Wow, we want good success, but give it to me free. No responsibility. Oh, that's not what it says. It says, you take care that you know the laws of God and don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. The, the left. Uh, stay on the straight and narrow path. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, Thinking, well, let's see now, let's see, that's working. No, that's not what they meant. You don't put this in your mouth. The message, the knowledge of what's in the book is what you keep in your head and what comes out of your mouth. Keep busy with it. Don't depart from the law, either to the left or to the right. Okay, uh, the book of the law, okay. Uh, I want to go down a little further and find the half verse I left behind. Uh, meditate therein day and night. Sometimes we get ourselves so worn out with this world that when we climb into bed, it's gone. <laughs> you fall asleep and everything goes <laughs> to sleep. Uh, no, we've got to meditate, read God's Word in the night, day and night, and, uh, and, know, and know it. It's what it's getting at. Understand it and know it. See what's written therein that thou mayest have, might have thy way prosperous, a good success, prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, here is well I need. Have not I commanded thee, this is Heavenly Father talking to us, 
talking to Joshua. Haven't I commanded you this? Be strong and have good courage. He just said that up here in the verse above. Neither be thou dismayed. Do we need to listen to that? There's ever so many people in this world today that are bored about this or they're tired of that and they can't stand this, they don't want this, their life is upside down, they don't know how to... What's God saying here? We don't act that way. We don't behave that way. We have a better outlook on life. Pleasant things to think on. And then we'll be prosperous. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Don't be dismayed. For the... Just me. Uh, I catch the right line here. Uh, neither be dis- for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Oh, some think. Oh, uh, maybe if I went in the ocean, that God wouldn't find me. Maybe if I went over. That's Psalms, isn't it? Where can I hide from you? David said that. He's talking to God. He says, "Where can I hide from? No, I can't hide from you." Heavenly Father is everywhere. He knows everything, does everything. And you know what? He never says whoops. When he was making creation, he did not go whoops. Guess I got to start again or something. No, he did it right the first time. <laughs> okay. So this is what is here in this book of the Bible as well as other books of the Bible and being talked to other people about how they should have success. So he says... Do it my way and you will have success. I'm with you. That's God talking. I'm with you. You can't run ahead of me. You can't run behind. I heard of some people that came to a conference one time in Canada and they said, you know what? Your guardian angel just arrived 15 minutes ago. After him. (laughs) He was speeding on the highway. No, that's not how Christians behave. That's not a good example. It was a good joke. But yeah, he told that brother that he was driving too fast. (laughs) He's breaking the speed limit. That's not the way God does things. That's not a right kind of law to, uh, to act like that and to show others. We need to be committed to Christ. Few words, but very serious and very deep. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23, chapter 5, 23, it reads this way. I've got it written out here, so I'll read it off my, my writings. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, holy, preserved, blameless. Should read a little better than that and differently. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, be preserved blameless. And I wrote in above here, and the very God of peace sanctifieth you. Wow. That takes some reading and some thinking as well, isn't it? God's going to sanctify us. The grace of God is going to be with us and verify us and help us and walk with us wholly. Not part of it, but the whole thing. He will come to us and we'll direct our lives unto the coming. How, how long will he stay with us? How will he take care of us? Holy, completely. But then it says, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We got that promise in the scriptures. That he's going to stay with us. He's going to work with us. He's going to help us all the way until Jesus comes. Yeah, it's amazing. Some Christians fall short. Why? Because they want to please themselves instead of pleasing God. Because they're not totally committed to the Heavenly Father. You know, you ask people, would you do so-and-so? Well, only if so-and-so. I tried that on God one time. He proved me wrong. (laughs) I was in Missouri coming down to Oklahoma all the way from um, St. Joseph, Missouri. And I talked with God and I said, you know, it's a lot hotter down there and I don't do hot. Boy, was I wrong. Missouri was hot and very cold in the wintertime. Oklahoma, we had winds. Less humidity. 
half of the state is more tree, the other half is more wheat fields and cattle. Hey, I can handle this. <laughs> yes. God knows before he asks us to come or go or do his, his will. God knows already what's, what's needed. So we need to not be like some people that would insist on having their will over God's will. You know, I'll do it if or I won't do it. My will is better than God's will. No, you're going to get in trouble. It's the wrong way to do it. Take God's will, do his will, and he'll see us through. So uh, spiritual success demands complete abandonment of self. Whoa, now that's a big word. Complete. Giving up of yourself. Turning it all over to God. Saying, I, I know I'll make it if you take care of me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I could have been a lighthouse operator. I could have been a fighter pilot. I, oh, I would love that. Faster the better. You know. No, God was saying, no, 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 no. That's not the right way to go. And in six months after, eight months after we were married, I gave up, gave up Canada. Figure that isn't hard. Give up my, my country and go to the United States and then immigrate to the United States. Why would I ever do that? I had this beautiful country up there and lots of room for people to live. We got used to the cold and we knew how to clo clothe ourselves. <laughs> In California, or some of the movies, you, under, you worry about whether they understand what it is to put clothes on. <laughs> anyway, um, life can change. But can you make it permanent? Can you say that, that I'm going to abandon myself, my own will, and put God first? We have to have the acceptance of God's will. Acceptance. That, that means, uh, okay, God, I understand you know these things. You know how to handle this. You know how to make it work. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put you in, in my will. Uh, let's see. We know the verse that says that everything will work together for those that love the Lord and do it according to his will. That's in Romans chapter eight twenty eight. I think I'll be quicker at this if I do this away. And go to your Romans. Why do they make the, <laughs> the place to hunt for your verse in very small print? Mm, right there, Romans chapter 8. And verse 28. There. Okay. It always gives it to me twice, so I want to know if I should read it on the left side or the right side, but <laughs> here we go. Um, and I need to go one up or one down. In verse 28, so this is Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work to, how do you know that it does work? I like to stop and catch myself on these verses a lot of times. I, wait a minute now. Do I agree with what I just read? We know. How do we know? Because we know Jesus Christ. We know God is unfailing. There's no shadow of turning. When God turns, there's no shadow. Because there's never anything wrong with God. He doesn't do anything wrong and, and difficult and, and try to trick you. God doesn't do things that way. There's no shadow. No evil can cast a shadow because there isn't one there. God has no evil in him at all. For we know the person writing this, and, and we understand because of all of our reading of the scriptures, we should be reading daily. You can look in many places and highly recommends that you read the Bible every day. Now, you only need about 20 minutes a day and you'll, you'll make it for the whole year. You'll read through the entire Bible. <laughs> okay. So it's not a big deal, not a problem. For we, the person that's writing, and you should know that all things work together for good 
to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Are you called? If you're not, you're in trouble. If you don't act like you're called, if you're not a saint, when they write to the book, to somebody in this city, in this town, or whatever, the saints at, are you a saint? If you're not, you're in big trouble. You're not trying. You're not working at it. You're not winning. You're not going to have success. Wow, a saint. Yeah, we're not supposed to be sinners and, and act like it and behave like it. Just to live righteously. So God is good. God loves us all. That's what we get from that. And we are called. If you look back through your life and you say, at this, at this point in my life, the road curved. I had a sermon like that quite a few years ago. The, the turn in the road. Yeah. Where did your life change? I could tell you where it changed. A couple of times. One time just before we left Saskatchewan and went to British Columbia. Why did God make that road turn? Oh, it was good for us. Yeah, it was a fantastic blessing that we went to British Columbia. How does a guy from Saskatchewan meet up a girl with a girl from Idaho? It's just not going to happen, right? Oh, but God did. God made it happen. I had to pray and say, God, is this for real? Is this person for me? I must have preached that too in Missouri because my son came to me just before he got married. He said, stood in the kitchen and he said, Dad, I don't know what would happen if she gave up on me. If I never married her. And I had to talk with him. But making the right choices, choosing God, choosing righteousness, choosing the pathway of righteousness, I had to talk with him. And he said, yep. He said, I'm sure. I'm positive. God's going to do it. I'll get the right person the, right, the first time. <laughs> okay, The right person the first time. Anyway, uh, yeah, he's got a purpose for us. That's why I've got that verse there. We need to uh, have confidence in Christ. Sometimes we say, oh yeah, God can do everything, but I don't know about Jesus, you know. <laughs> why not? Yeah, son of God. <laughs> you know, he can. Oh yeah, the son of God can do anything he wants to do and, and could make it really tough on us if we didn't obey him. But the, the, God's not that way, and they haven't, Jesus is not that way. They love you. They draw you, convince you to come. Uh, I want uh, 1 John. Oh, I love 1 John. If you get to reading and you want to read something really neat, read 1 John. Yep. That's where you find a lot of we. We know this. Hmm. Find first John this way. I think will be easier. Peter and first John. There's we know and know and knowing and knoweth 37 chimes in this little book of five small chapters. I think they wanted us to know something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Read it. It's great. Okay, chapter. Uh, or First John, the little Johns, First John, and chapter five, and verse fourteen. Five, verse fourteen. And this is the confidence that we have. So he's got it as well. He's telling us we ought to have it. We have in him, in Christ Jesus, because he's talking about this in the whole chapter, the way it's going, the chapter. We have this confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Ask anything. He's going to hear us. And he's going to want to do something good for us. Yeah, conf the uh, confidence. Confidence. We, that's why we'd ask. Otherwise, if you didn't have confidence in Jesus, why bother? You know, that comes into all kinds of thoughts. 
If you're going to pray for somebody for healing, how confident are you that he's hearing you and he's actually going to answer your prayer? Yeah. Yeah. We've got to ask the right things as well so that we know that he's going to answer and and that you're going to get the correct response that you're hoping for. If we have that confidence in him that if we ask anything, Sometimes we leave stuff out and don't bother asking. Just say, well, it'll, it'll work its way out. You know, how did that one person put that? Uh, hmm, maybe I can't think of it now. Time and chance happens to everybody. Yeah, don't. <laughs> that is a wrong attitude. The Bible says that it will happen, but we don't want that attitude. We want God's blessing on what we're asking and that we're going to do by God's will so we know he's going to answer. Yeah, not, not the other way around. Okay, so we have that confidence. And then uh, uh, that if we ask anything, that he will hear us. He's hearing us. When we talk about things that are not wholesome and not right, or wanting to do wrong things, he's hearing. He's listening. Okay, then uh, verse 15. And if, and if we know that he hears us. Do you know that? Are you confident that he is listening to you? That's what that verse really is telling us. If we know, we ought to know, that he hears us. Whosoever he asks, or whatsoever he asks, uh, we know that he will, that, that, oh, here we go with the eyes again, and the size of print. And if we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that, that we have the petitions that we desire of him. That's how confident we are that he's going to give it to us that we ask for. He won't give us the wrong things. There's lots of verses about that too, about if a daddy asks, the son asks the daddy, will you give me so-and-so? Won't you give it to him? Well, how about your heavenly father? Doesn't he know what you need and what's good for you? Yeah, God will give you that. And so Jesus is right there. Uh, We will have the petitions that we desire because he's going to answer us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. First, you've got to know that you're asking properly, that when you get what you ask for, (laughs) you don't want to say afterwards, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Because he will give it to us. We said one time, we'll never go back to Missouri. Whoops. Had to go back for four years. <laughs> uh, God knows. God knows. And he can take care of us while we're there. I thought I'd seen the end of the earth when I was there in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I figured that's why all of the people were joining the wagon train and going west. <laughs> God knew where he wanted me. And he brought me back to Oklahoma, and I've been happy. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to go into architectural drafting. God made me so happy with that architectural drafting that I could look out the window and see the flowers and the trees and the things and be doing my drawing board things and look out there and see cars flying off the road because of the icy streets. And, <laughs> and then when the sun came out, I could go outside and pick these little blackberries that crawl along the ground, and they were really sweet. I loved them. We had three kinds of, of blackberries up there. The medium size, or the little ones on the ground, and then a medium size, they were bitter, usually. But they were firmer and they lasted longer after the other ones had gone. Then there was the big ones, big, juicy, just run all over your mouth, blackberries. And, you know, we had no bugs in the blackberries, no snakes in the blackberries. Oh, it was heaven on earth. I'll tell you. (laughs) God knows where he wants us and what he can do for us. Yep. (laughs) So we have confidence because we see those things happening and talk with other people about their time in uh, trusting God, being with God. And be sure you look at the, we did so-and-so, we did so-and-so. There's tests for your salvation in here. This is what you need to do. We do so-and-so, you ought to do so-and-so. Is tests right here. Are you doing that? If you do, that's what you need to find out. What happens if you do and if you don't? There's the if are written in this little book. Good book. Okay. Uh, 
in this one I want to carry on for the confidence in Christ. The world and national conditions have caused a breakdown of trust. You find trust all over the Bible. Trust in God, trust in the book, trust, trust in this. And people are not trusting. And they're not having confidence. They're not trusting. They're not seeing that the trust is available. Um, they're just not confident in anything that's going on around them. Uh, things are collapsing in our world and they can't say, well, if you go to school long enough, you'll learn something. And no, you probably just get confused. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we have to look at this confidence and try to find it somewhere. A national confidence, you can't trust anybody. Everybody you think you're going to put your trust in, they fall flat. And their, their, um, uh, their respect and all the other things that would go with an office in, in government is collapsed. Wow, what do you got left? Nothing except Christ. Christ is the answer. Heavenly Father is the answer. You drop that, what do you got? Nothing. Okay. This whole truth is uh, government and business. Can you trust those guys that advertise on TV? Oh, they say, tell your doctor that you would like to use this product. And the doctor says, well, if you'd like. You're not getting advice. You're not something to trust in. Yeah. So everything in church, can you trust churches? How many people have we heard that are church this and church that and church that? And what awful report you hear later. You cannot trust it. most anybody. You can't trust them. So what do you do? Get one-on-one -on -one with God. Get one-on-one -on -one with Christ. Live righteously. Do, it, do Heavenly Father's will. Okay, family save you? No. Lots of families collapse, go, go bad, go, go sour. Things go difficult, go, things go wrong. Uh, you hear about people that you think would, would last forever and you find out they, they bailed out or they crashed, one or the other. You can't trust. Christ is still true. We need to really look to Christ and plead for righteousness with him and to, to find ways to work with Jesus. Work with the right side of the street and the right path and the straight path. And yeah, we need to really work at that. Uh, Jesus will never represent something wrong, misrepresent. He wouldn't do that. When he came to the cross, there was not one thing they could pin on him that he did wrong. Wow, amazing. And he died for us. We weren't worthy. He was, but he died for us. We need to safely have confidence in him, in Jesus Christ. And never he'll never misrepresent nor uh, lose his trustworthiness with us. The spiritual success will come through that. The compassion that we need to have is like Christ's compassion. And can we? Oh, sometimes you see people driving along. I'll say I don't show my fist above the... <laughs> but every once in a while you're driving and that's so-and-so. Why did he act that way? Why did he behave that way? Why are we... Those are not good, good results. They, there's always a chance of us getting overtaxed, the scripture uses too. Here's a verse in uh, Luke 7, 4, 13. And the Lord saw her, and he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. So I wrote out here to the side, explain the story. You could put together a number of different stories that sound a little bit similar like this, but you know what happened? This poor woman... Her husband died. And then her son died. She was a widow and no son to help her. That's a real disaster. 
as in those days, usually the women did not work away from home during their living. A few went gleaning in the fields and brought home the, for the family, for a mother-in-law, and she gleaned in the fields and brought for herself as well. And you think, well, God's got me on the downhill slide here. I don't know if this is going to work. What? And, and disaster after disaster, you could do these. And then you find out God saved him from all of them. There was a lady, I'm desperately trying to think of her name, Naomi, and Ruth. Ruth had a disastrous home. She had a glean in the fields. What was her life life like after that? Husband had died. She was in Jesus' family line. Whoa. She was a foreigner, an outsider from a foreign country. They didn't speak very well of them, neither. She is in the family line of Jesus. This lady wasn't quite that bad off, but along came Jesus. And he touched the coffin. And he said uh, something to indicate to stop. You know, they stopped from carrying and going on. And he spoke to the boy that was dead on the, in the coffin or on the, on the coffin, the way they carried it. And he sat up and spoke. Wow. Then he took this breadwinner for the family to the mother and said, here's your son. Was there joy? Oh, oh wow. Don't weep. I got it. I'm taking care of you. <laughs> yeah. Those are shockers that wake you up. And say, he's got it. He understands. He's with us. Jesus had that kind of compassion. And we need to think of the compassion we ought to have towards people that are destitute and heartaches and deaths and all kinds of things. The infirmities of others Jesus was concerned about. He healed eyes. He healed the lame. He healed the halt. And it talks many times. Uh, when I was looking this up, I don't think I got it further down, but I'm going to give it away now, maybe. Um, John the Baptist wanted to know if Jesus was the one. Or should we wait for another, call for another, Messiah, Savior of the world. And Jesus did some things. He healed the blind, he healed this, he did that, he did that, he did that. And then he said to John's disciples, he says, you go and tell them what you saw and what you heard. Your testimony is worth more. Because you can tell what was done in your life by the Heavenly Father, by Jesus Christ. You can tell that testimony. I can't tell it. I'd be carrying somebody else's story, right? You've got to tell your own story. Wow. So John's uh, believers that followed him, which were really following Christ, and which would have switched over very easily when Jesus became king of kings. <laughs> um, but as soon as Jesus was known to be the Messiah, and then he went and um, died, rose again from the grave, and went to heaven to be with his father. And he said, I'm going to be with your father and my father, Jesus' father, your God and my God. Did you know Jesus has a God? It says father. That's what he says in the Bible. Wow, pretty neat, eh? So it was Jesus doing these things. Jesus that could do the healing. We obtain spiritual success when we are compassionate and pray for the sick. Help the needy and comfort the bereaved. Comfort the, the, that lady and others. We need to be like Jesus, have that kind of compassion. Okay, um, cooperate. Sometimes people want to do their own thing. Just point me in the direction and leave me alone. No, that's not really. We need to be cooperative with Christ. What does Jesus want done nowadays? Is he concerned about winning more people into the kingdom of God? Yep, he sure is. So we need to have that kind of workmanship with Jesus. We are workers together with him, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. We are workers together with Jesus Christ. 
He wants us to work there and wants us to do those things that we should be doing. Many Christians fail to work for Christ as they should. Well, I go to church once a week or I, you know, but they don't really get in there with Christ and see what Christ would do. Do you remember the stories in the Bible? Uh, I can't go to that dinner because I bought a team of oxen. I can't go to that dinner because with the Lord because I got married. What? I guess that's the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. If Christ can't be with you, is there an embarrassment there? (laughs) Okay. So we have to work with Christ and carry that compassion and work with him. Um, in, In fact, another way of looking at it is when we go to do God's work, you presume that you're going to be witnessing. So, okay, what should you take along? Well, take a pen. It's got the church name on it. It's got the phone number on there. You can give it away and they'll, they'll take it because it's got a spongy thing on the top for poking the computers. They'll take it. And then you witness to them about your life, how your life was changed when you changed to be with Jesus. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, how did your life change? You can do that testimony. You can work with the sick, visit the sick, um, help the needy, visit the needy, uh, comfort the bereaved. Yep, we can do those things. So we will be working with Jesus in those cases and he will travel with us and help us. If we neglect that sort of an action and that point of entrance into this, uh, then you're, um, um, you're not helping anymore. Uh, we're going to not be working for Christ or with Christ, but we're working with him also if he is working with us and we know that we can trust him. When we have to go somewhere, he's with us. And even when you go to the courts or when you go to this or you go to that, um, you're going to be asked or questioned or something, he's with us. So we'll have that blessing of having him with us and we working with him. The Holy Spirit will work with us Put words in our mouth. Give us the need, needed goodies at the right time. Work of Christ, we are working with him. And then we can go and invite people to church, invite people to the meal, to the church, to the final dinner. You could invite a person and witness to them. And so, Because you know what you're doing? You're giving them a billion dollars of goods. You know what? Well, if you get to God's thousand year reign and you've got all, for a thousand years you're going to live with Christ and in, in, in this fantastic world that Jesus is rebuilding and so on. And then what happens? Heavenly Father comes and his kingdom's going to land on this earth. And you live forever. There's no end to these blessings. You can give that to somebody else. You want to take that? You can live like a king the rest of your life. And that's true. That's a true statement. Get into Jesus' kingdom where Jesus is sitting on David's throne, king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah, you'll have all the goodies. We can be content through Christ. We don't have to look for the billions of dollars or I, I always like to tease with that a little bit because it's true. You can have it all if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Wow. Discontentment, that's not going to be there. We shouldn't be in that state. Where we have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. That's Philippians 4, 11. Discontentment is everywhere in our world. It's prevalent everywhere. Many are trying to find contentment through possessions. How much can you buy? How much you got? You don't think it's real? You drive up to some home and they open the garage door. What do you see? Loaded with stuff. (laughs) They're not content. They're just filling their barns, the granaries the Bible talks about. They're not content. And that verse says, don't you know that this night your, your name could be called? You could die. And who are you going to leave it to? 
Yeah. So we need to be content and not uh, worry about possessions or pleasures or popularity. People always want some kind of popularity. They gotta have the, the right kind of car or the right kind of this or the right kind of that so they can impress somebody. That's not, not what it's all about. Real and lasting contentment is found only in Jesus and his Father. Jesus, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. He satisfies the longing soul. They even say this in, in science kind of ideas is that man has something missing. Mankind has something missing. And he's searching for it. Well, we know where it is. It's Jesus Christ and his heavenly Father and the things he'd want us to do. Then I put a part of a verse here in 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness and contentment is great gain. I like the King James way of wording that. Godliness. We need to think on godliness, ways of behavior and actions. Our longing soul needs it. If we want success, really success, we need Jesus Christ. Because then we can say godly, godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's where I'm heading. You know, that's where all of us ought to how to plan our, our future. Okay. I think that's a pretty good amount of sermon. And I usually don't recap and redo it. I think you got it the first time. <laughs> okay. May God bless you.